him out of this big temple in the middle of town, and he spoke to the people on the steps of the church. And when he concluded what he had to say, he turned around and walked back into the church building, and Domingo snuck away from his dad and followed that man into the church. And he was at the door when he saw the man in the black robe go off to the left and into uh, another room and close the door. Well, Domingo walked up to the door, knocked on the door, and heard from the inside this, come in. And so Domingo opened the door and walked in. And he walked in with his head on his chin and his hat pulled down over his eyes. He was very frightened, very afraid. And he said to the person who was sitting on, on the other side of the desk, good morning, sir. And the person responded, good morning, boy. And Domingo lifted his face up and he said, can I see the black book that you had? And it was sitting on the table there. And the priest shoved it across the desk to Domingo. And Domingo looked him right in the eye and he said, I had a dream about that book. And the person in the dream told me that someday I would help the person who had that black book put the words in that book in my language. Well, the man on the other side of the desk stood up and looked Domingo in the eye and said, well, that book is the Bible. And we're here to tell you what that book means. This book will never be in your language because it's our job to tell you what it means. And so that was unsettling to Domingo, and he didn't have a response to that because he was sure that that was the person that he would help translate the Bible. He turned on his heel and walked out of the office. And Domingo grew up, and at about age 36, Domingo was born in 1932, he was 11 years old when he had the dream. I was 11 years old when I wrote the story about wanting to be a missionary when I grew up. I'm 25 years old. Domingo is 36 years old now. We had never met. One day, Domingo was coming down from his mountain home. And because there was a fog that morning, some of the pine needles were kind of slippery. And maybe there was a drizzle as well. And in coming down the mountainside, he slipped on the pine needles. And in order to break his fall, he reached out and mistakenly grabbed his sharpened machete that was in his belt. And he cut his hand from the index finger all the way down to the heel of his hand. And he closed it over on itself and wrapped it tightly in a bandage to try to stop the bleeding. It took him about an hour and a half to walk the rest of the way down the town. He had already heard that there was a white person in town, a woman, who had a clinic. And it was the only show in town. There were no doctors. There were no other nurses. There were two pharmacies in town, but they didn't do consultations, much less sew up somebody who was cut. And so Domingo walked into where my wife, Rachel, had the clinic. Rachel opened up the bandage, saw all the dirt in the wound, cleaned it out, and opened it up, and she could see clear down to the bone severed ligaments, tendons. And Rachel prayed before she proceeded with Domingo, put 56 stitches in his hand, closed it up, and gave a fistful of antibiotics in his other hand and said, take so many a day, come back in five days, and I'll take the stitches out. Friday of that week, Domingo came back. This time he had a chicken under his arm. And he walked into Rachel's clinic, and he opened his hand up, and it was a little dirty. She cleaned it up again. But after taking the stitches out, Domingo had full use of every one of his fingers. Domingo was so thankful that he offered this hen from his chicken flock as payment for what Rachel had done. And at the same time, he said, isn't there anything else I can do for you because I work with my hands. This is, this is how I make my living, and I'm so grateful. Is there anything else I can do? Well, Rachel very astutely said, yes, my husband is interested in learning, learning your language. Would you be interested in coming and teaching him your language? Well, next Monday morning at 6 o'clock, Domingo knocked on our door. Fortunately, Rachel had told me over the weekend that he might be coming on Monday. I was still in bed. I <laughs> got up and walked out to the door, and there was Domingo, and he explained to me a little bit of what had happened and that he was there to teach me his language. 
To make a long story short, Romeo Kishan became my main informant. He taught me the language, taught me all of the legends and myths about their culture, and he was the one that was the principal in the translation of the scriptures in his language. I didn't know about his dream until we came to the book of Acts, and we were translating the story about Paul having a dream about going over into Macedonia and not going further up into Asia. And Domingo saw that dreams are important to God, and they're in the Bible. So why not share my dream with Brother Vasey? By that time, Domingo had accepted the Lord as his personal Savior, and uh, he and his wife were married, and with all of their children at the ceremony, seven of them, okay, they were baptized that same afternoon and became the first two uh, Indian believers in that culture. That was about 1972. Now, when we were translating the first chapter of the book of Matthew, I didn't realize this. I found out later from Wycliffe personnel. I don't work for Wycliffe Bible translators, but I was doing a translation. Um, first chapter of the book of Matthew is pretty much genealogy. If you're like me, when you get to genealogies in the scriptures, you see so-and-so beget so-and-so, and you look down with your eyes to the last one, and it says, and so-and-so beget so-and-so, that's the end of it. I skip over that part. I don't know about you. <laughs> it, it's boring. But we translated the first chapter of the book of Matthew. Fourteen generations from Abraham to David, fourteen generations from David to the exile, fourteen generations from the exile to the Christ child. And then we translated the story of the birth of Jesus, which I'm sure many of you have read this Christmas season. About a week later, we're now in chapter 2 or 3 of the book of Matthew, you can't remember. Domingo said to me, let's go back to the first chapter of Matthew. Now, we would already set the ground rules in translation because he had never had school, never had training as a translator, and I'm just a novice translator. I told him, I said, whenever you're uncomfortable with a section of Scripture, Whenever God shows you something uh, or shows me something, we're going to go back and revisit it because that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is not happy with, with how things are going because our spirits are not happy with what happened. So he said, let's, let's go back to chapter 1. And so we looked at chapter 1 again, read the whole chapter to him, and he stopped. And he said to me, he said, Brother Bill, he started to name to me his ancestor. He went back 14 generations. This man has never been to school. But through oral tradition, it was handed down to him the names and a phrase, like an epitaph on a gravestone, of every one of his relatives back 14 generations. I didn't even know the name of my mother's grandfather. I, named, I knew the names of both of my grandpas because I'm named after both of them. William Leslie. But my grandpa on my mom's side, I didn't know his name. I didn't know the name of my grandpa, of my great grandpa on my grandpa's side. And, and, and I've got a college education and a seminary degree. And so what is wrong with this picture? I started to say to myself. He said to me, after having translated that section of scripture, I know that he's the Son of God. That was his conclusion on the basis of his credentials, on the basis of his ancestry. He was the first believer in Jesus Christ amongst the Mayan Indians of the town of Hoyavach on the basis of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You know, every word, every letter, every jot and tittle is inspired of the Holy Spirit. And if God chooses to use the genealogy, to bring somebody to himself, he's going to do it. And the first convert amongst the Indians of Hoyavach came to know Christ on the basis of the, the orderliness and the fact that their names are mentioned and a brief, like, epitaph of their lives is mentioned as well. He was blown away by that. And so uh, this, guy, this guy is genius level. 